Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Revolution. Uh, hey guys. Okay. In November... Especially, uh, remembering and learning that... The, the Germans lost even after they, they did not have to fight on a second front any longer. And so, like the opposite of World War I, where a second front was opened, and then Germany was crushed. I know it's debatable whether or not they would have been beaten anyway because they got stopped in Russia. But um, thinking that, or realizing that, you know, the Russian Revolution going on, Russia gets out of the war, now Germany just needs to worry about the the front uh, on France and Belgium and Netherlands. Curious how exactly uh, they lost. So that's what we're here to learn. My name's Connor. if you're new. Link to the original video, top of the description. As always, below that link to the Discord, we'd love to have you. It makes it easier for me to interact with you. See your recommendations. Number 19. Did I say that already? I'm losing my mind. Jeez, okay. In November Let's learn. Great war. November 1918, the German army was beaten and Germany in the grip of revolution. Less than a year earlier, though, Germany and its allies controlled most of Eastern Europe, had defeated Russia, and outnumbered the British and French in the West. So why did Germany lose the First World War? The German Empire entered the First World War in August 1914 with the most powerful army in the world. But by November 1918, it had been forced to sign an armistice on Allied terms, and a revolution had replaced the empire with a republic. The explanation for Germany's defeat in the last year of the war is not as simple as a numbers game. Yes, the Allies had more men and more money, and the longer the war lasted, the more likely it was that the Allies could win, all things being equal. But nothing in history is inevitable, and all things were not equal. Germany lost its chance to win a quick victory in 1914 when the French won the Battle of the Marne, but the Central Powers may have had a chance to avoid total defeat. As historian Holger Afflerbach put it, it was impossible for Germany to win the war after 1914, but it required very grave mistakes to lose it. Both the Allies and Germans made good and bad decisions that shaped the war's outcome. But only Germany's decisions lay within its control, and it was by far the strongest member of the Central Powers. So that's why we'll focus on them to explain Germany's defeat in 1918. Germany's famous war plan in 1914, the Schlieffen Plan, might have been its best chance to win the war against a more powerful enemy alliance. But as 19th century Prussian General Helmut von Molke the Elder admitted, in war, nothing is certain. No plan of operations extends with certainty beyond the first encounter with the enemy's main strength. The German High Command learned that lesson the hard way in August and September 1914. German planners and commanders pushed their men past their limits, expected too much from the army they actually had, neglected logistics, and made critical operational mistakes. Coupled with a desperate and effective reaction by the French at the Marne, the result ensured the war would not be over quickly. To make matters worse for the Germans, they drew Britain into the war by violating Belgian neutrality. The wild gamble had gone wrong. France was still fighting, and now Britain was too, leaving the Central Powers to face the unhappy prospect of a long war. Still, the Central Powers weren't necessarily doomed to total defeat, even if outright victory was unlikely. Some historians argue they might have forced some sort of compromise peace even against stronger enemies, if it weren't for more risks and mistakes they made from 1914 to 1917. The High Command failed to effectively reassess its strategy after the defeats of 1914 and develop a coherent plan to win or at least force acceptable peace terms. The army wasted precious manpower in the failed Verdun offensive and the flawed defensive tactics on the Somme in 1916. Planners were unable to maintain food production to compensate for the effects of the Allied blockade. Germany failed to properly manage its alliance. Austria-Hungary and Germany didn't always coordinate their military operations, and Kaiser Karl even tried to start peace talks without the Germans knowing. Germany did have some uh, not so great allies in both wars. Not a great team. Germany's system of government even tried to start peace talks without the Germans knowing. 
Germany's system of governance was also ineffective. The Kaiser had an important role in the system, but was weak. The military eventually took over, but didn't know how to run the economy or politics and interfered with those who did. And another huge gamble that blew up in their faces was the renewal of unrestricted submarine warfare in 1917, which failed to knock Britain out of the war and brought the United States in. Now, that's not to say that Germany didn't have some successes. They, with Austro-Hungarian help, inflicted devastating defeats on Russia and Serbia in 1915, Romania in 1916, and Italy in 1917. They managed, with far fewer resources, to produce enormous quantities of weapons, to develop new ways of producing fertilizer, and convince the Ottomans and Bulgarians to join the Central Powers. The Allies, of course, also made mistakes. Inefficient use of their greater resources, disastrous offensives in Lorraine and East Prussia in 1914, Gallipoli and Champagne in 1915, on the Somme in 1916, and in Flanders and on the Chemende Dam and in the Kerensky Offensive in 1917. The difference was that as the weaker belligerent in a long war, Germany had no margin for error, and every mistake it made brought it closer to defeat. The same was not true of the Allies. Their prospects for victory, once the US joined in 1917, were intact, while the German High Command and admitted in late 1916 it could not defeat the Allies on land in the West. So Germany failed to win a quick victory in 1914, then saw its chances for avoiding defeat further reduced by mistakes in the following years. But then the Bolshevik Revolution in late 1917 gave Germany one last chance for avoiding defeat. And so Germany gambled once again. In December 1917, the Central Powers and Bolshevik Russia agreed to an armistice and eventually... Interesting. So is he, sorry, is he about to say that the fact that they no longer had a two-front war, so maybe Germany would have survived intact without losing if the Russians never pulled out because, so, so, because then the Germans were like, all right, now it's one front, now let's be extra bold. Is that what he's going to... For 1917, the Central Powers and Bolshevik Russia agreed to an armistice and eventually signed the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in early 1918. With Russia out of the war, Germany now in control of vast territories in Eastern Europe and American troops not yet in France in large numbers, Berlin had one last chance to influence the outcome of the war. As German divisions moved from east to west in early 1918, the High Command prepared one more great gamble, and many in the Allied camp feared defeat. Feet. British Cabinet Secretary Maurice Hankey reported the worries of General John Duquesne. Duquesne envisages the possibility of the French army being smashed and cut off from us, the enemy demanding as a condition of peace the handing over of all the ports from Rouen, Havre to Dunkirk, and in the event of a refusal, the remorseless hammering of our army by the whole German army. He considers that, if we wanted to go on with the war, we should have to face the prospect of a million prisoners in France. Some Germans had questioned what the coming offensives could achieve, like Social Democrat politician Philipp Scheidemann. Suppose we were to take Calais and Paris. Suppose such a breakthrough were completely successful. Would that mean peace? We've overrun entire states, we've chased hostile governments from the land, and yet we still have no peace. Most Germans, though, held out hope that victory was still within reach. On March 21st, 1918, the German army launched the so-called Kaiser's Battle, or Operation Michael, against the British Fifth Army. More than 70 divisions, supported by 6,500 guns, sliced into 34 British divisions in an attempt to split the two Allied armies. German forces pushed back the British, took 75,000 prisoners, and achieved unheard of advances in the West since 1914. Ludendorff explained that he would set objectives as the attacks progressed. On the fly. In Russia, we always merely set an intermediate objective and then discovered where to go next. 
But by April 5th, the German drive had run out of steam and the British, with French help, managed to stabilize the situation. The German high command then unleashed a series of follow-up offensives against both British and French sectors. Operations Georgette in April, Blücher York in May, Gneisenau in June, and Friedensturm in July. In the end, these last-ditch attacks all made serious dents in Allied lines, but they did not result in the capture of any significant strategic objectives, and they didn't force the British and French to ask for peace terms. The Western Front was not Russia, and the Allies managed to pool their reserves to stabilize the front, with General Ferdinand Foch taking overall command. The French then launched a major counteroffensive in July, which began to turn the tide for good. The British followed with their own attack on August 8th, a day Ludendorff called the Black Day of the German Army. From then on, the Allies advanced without stopping during the so-called 100 Days Offensive, and while the German Army still fought back, it was a beaten force. The Allies also achieved crushing victories over the Ottomans, Bulgarians, and Austro-Hungarians in the closing phase of the war, meaning that even if Germany could somehow hold out for longer in the West, it was completely unable to defend itself in the South and Southeast. In October, Ludendorff told Berlin to ask for an armistice since the war was lost, and the fighting came to an end November 11th, 1918. So what happened in that critical period that resulted not in the German victory General Duquesne and others feared, but in a clear military defeat? I this in another video. Um, the, 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 the gameplay for, for France and for Germany is very different, it seems, than the game plan for Russia or the UK, certainly for the United States. Um, but uh, let me, this is what I mean. Is that Russia has just an enormous, it, you might as, like, ju just like the United States, its greatest defense is the two giant oceans on either side that you have to get across. Russia seems to have oceans of land where it's like, okay, well, keep going and now stop trying to, and then, it's like, well, okay, surely if we get to Moscow, then they'll give up. And, and, and so, and, and again with Britain, although the, the English Channel, I, I would say, definitely less formidable than the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, and maybe even less formidable than just the vast landscape, albeit flat, into Russia, Britain ha has its enormous navy, so it, it can... It can go and 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 block things, and like you, you, they c still can't advance to you with their army. They have to cross the channel, which you're gonna have to get through the British Navy to get to Britain. And, and, and so, this is what I mean for Napoleon and for for uh, Mustache Man. Can't say his name for, um, you know, Angry Mustache Guy. He must not be named that guy. Uh, is that at the end of the day, you're just doomed to defeat if you if you keep traveling. And so, unless Germany has someone like the British on the same side of Germany, or or Britain on the same side as France in the Napoleonic Wars, or say uh, the U.S., if, uh, then you're so constricted. You 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 can. Like, your best chance is a big push, and even if you get a big push, you can't really get to your main people you need to defeat, like the British, who are not going to let you cross the channel, and are, are just going to wait, go around their empire, get resources and men, and then attack somewhere else. And it, it just seems like you need... You need the U.S. and the British, or you know, one of the two, to really solidify and win in in Europe. It it, it just it seems like you can't do it. it. Maybe Germany could have it if you just stopped and didn't do the Soviet uh, uh, offensive, uh, Barbarossa. I don't know, but it just seems like hard mode if you're if you're France or if you're Germany trying to conquer Europe.
The German offensives from March to July broke their own army without gaining a decisive victory. In March and April alone, Let they me know lost 280,000 casualties. By the end of July, the figure was 977,000, and the killed and wounded were disproportionately from Germany's best units, including the famous stormtroopers. German soldier Frederick Meisel described the heavy losses. French shells began to hit to the right and the left of us, leaving human forms writhing in agony. Our advance came to a stop, and soon the French drum fire engulfed us. The air was filled with gas and flying pieces of steel. I reached for my gas mask, pulled it out of its container, then noticed to my horror that a splinter had gone through it, leaving a large hole. I felt like an animal cornered by hunters. I leapt at a man whose wound I had just bound, and in the next moment had ripped his gas mask from his face. The last thing I saw before putting on the mask were his pleading eyes. Whoa, that was powerful. Germany needed 200,000 replacements every month, but each month only saw 70,000 recovered wounded and an average of 25,000 new recruits. These losses caused overall German strength to fall from 5.1 million men in March to just 4 million men six months later. Meanwhile, the Allies were growing stronger even without Russia. The British released reserves they'd held in Britain, and by the end of the year, nearly 2 million Americans were in France. Even if the Americans played a lesser role in combat, their presence was important. German rifle strength had outnumbered the Allies by 1.57 million to 1.35 million in April, but by November, there were just 866,000 German riflemen facing 1.49 million Allied. German commanders also kept shifting priorities once each drive ran out of momentum. If the Germans had taken rail hubs like Amiens or Asbruck, they could have seriously threatened Allied logistics. Major Wilhelm von Leib was critical of the Army High Command, or OHL. OHL has changed direction. It has made its decisions according to the size of territorial gain rather than operational goals. The Germans had effective stormtrooper infantry tactics and innovated artillery tactics thanks to artillery officer Georg Buchmüller, but they couldn't turn them into... I'm sorry, how do you make... that just seems stupid. Like... I know hindsight, but... Is hindsight a German word? It sounds like one. Eyes of territory. Wording it like that makes it be like, what? Well, you'll gain rather than operational goals. All right, we conquered this much land. All right, what land was it? Where was it? Doesn't matter. It's a lot. Keep going. At the the Germans had effective stormtrooper infantry tactics and innovated artillery tactics thanks to artillery officer Georg Buchmüller, but they couldn't turn them into a campaign-winning strategy. The Allies, on the other hand, adapted and collaborated. When the German offensive threatened Allied positions, the British government released reserves from the home front. The Americans, who had insisted until now on keeping their army together, agreed to lend out some of their divisions to the French and British. The French transferred forces to the British to stop Michael in March as well. British commander Douglas Haig, who'd until now opposed being under French command, agreed to serve under French General Ferdinand Foch, who took over as supreme commander of Allied forces. And the Allies were better at the most modern form of warfare, combined arms war using the latest industrial weapons on a mass scale. Germany had invented... I had to restart because it took me way too long to say what I was trying to say. It, it really seems like this extremely horrific possible reality is that conflict only stops or at least stops for a long time when you absolutely slaughter or completely subdue and and eradicate any foreign very uh very uh culture and, and so think about the US for example okay or Canada, right? Uh, you take the U.S., really anywhere in the Americas, where the United States and Canada, very similar country, countries, if you combine both of them, you know, I, I believe they're bigger than Russia, not by much, which is insane. 
how the next two largest countries combined are only a bit larger than the largest, Russia. But that why isn't there that much tension on this enormous, enormous landmass, much large, far bigger than Europe? Not quite as many people, 200 million less people in, in, in Canada and in the USA rather than Europe. But it just seems like it, we all, like all of the native people were all wiped out completely, 99% through slaughtering and disease, right? And now you have this enormous continent, upper continent, that is very peaceful in terms of, of war. Obviously, there's, you want to talk about internal crime, not the most peaceful places, but in terms of warfare, it seems like the only way to really preserve that peace for a long time is to annihilate everyone, annihilate entire cultures, civilians, soldiers, and brutally suppress them, and then have a pretty a very cohesive culture and then save it and, and then and then we sit over here like oh well look at over there in europe can uh, should we get involved eh. and then we can sometimes do it and it seems like a really sad depressing thing about peace is that it seems the longer peace it seems like the longer peace lasts longer the more ferocious and thoroughly annihilating you are in your conquests. Is it, is, am I wrong there? Because it's scary, but it seems kind of true. Um, and that as long as, as you're near other people with very different language or, or culture that are si somewhat similarly, similarly, similarly powerful, then like peace is only, um, you know, a break before something else happens. And so that's a pattern that I kind of see in history that doesn't really look good. Um, I hope with the more global connection with the internet, I think a large key to peace is familiarity. I think when you don't know a lot about another p people and it's not easy to communicate with them, then deadly conflict is much more possible because it's much easier to see them as the them, you know? If you picture someone like, you know, Lord of the Rings, orcs are orcs, you know, orcs, there's nothing good about orcs. There's nothing you feel sorry about orcs in Lord of the Rings. It's, they are evil versus the humans and elves, good guys, dwarves, good guys. They're evil. And I, I think the more familiar you are with other people, the less you can give them that orc thing, which means like, oh, just, you know, kill them or, or whatever. So hopefully as we get more familiar with each other and see each other as humans who care about our family, don't want to die and want to live a, a, a somewhat peaceful life, then all out war is going to be more difficult, I hope. Believe it or not, that was a condensed version of what I just deleted in talking. But I, I hope you get my point there, and I, I hope I'm... Anyways, I'd like to hear your thoughts there, so let's continue. Technology from poison gas to flamethrowers, but the Allies beat the Germans at their own game. They had 800 tanks in the field, while the Germans had about 20. Had 4,500 aircraft to the Germans' 3,700, 18,000 guns to Germany's 14,000, and 100,000 motor vehicles to move supplies, of which the Germans only had about 30,000. France alone produced about 50% more planes than Germany in 1918. They caught up to the Germans in terms of the quality of heavy artillery and surpassed Germany in artillery pulled by tractors and available shells per battery. Historian David Stevenson summed up the shift. The Allies won the technological race and overtook their enemies not only in numbers but also in fighting power. In the process, they pioneered the characteristic forms of later 20th century warfare. Although the German army was beaten, it was still fighting in fall 1918, and Allied planners fully expected to fight on to complete victory in 1919. Instead, Germany suffered a devastating collapse in morale that ended the war sooner. 
Even before the spring offensives began, many German troops had lost hope, and this only got stronger as 1918 went on. Up to 180,000 German troops deserted en route to France or while well on leave in 1918. When they advanced in the field, some infamously stopped to plunder Allied supplies, but they also began attacking their own supply trains for food. British military intelligence also noticed the change based on prisoner interrogations. The belief is prevalent among officers and men that Germany cannot now win the war. After the offensives failed, surrenders became common, including groups or even whole units. This wave of surrenders accelerated until the November 11th armistice, as the army continued to slowly disintegrate. In just the last three months of the war, nearly 400,000 German troops surrendered. By some counts, almost as many French troops had surrendered in the entire war. Many within the rank and file became convinced that fighting no longer served Germany's interests, just those of the high command, the monarchy, and war profiteers, the so-called Schwindler. The main thing is that the Schwindel and the killing stop. It doesn't matter to us if we end up German or French. Like Swindle? Is that like Swindler? Others were more likely to surrender because they felt disoriented as units suffered such heavy losses that they lost cohesion and group loyalty. Overall, the army suffered a nominal loss rate of 140% in just over eight months. So if a unit had a thousand men in January 1918, by October, including all the new recruits and replacements who joined in that time, a total of 1,400 men were wounded. And commanders often threw the remnants of depleted units together instead of building them back up with replacements. Unit cohesion suffered even more because the military regime shuttled hundreds of thousands of men between the field army and industry as short-term priorities changed. At the same time, soldiers, sailors and civilians inside Germany had had enough as well. Workers suffering from malnutrition and war weariness went on strike and Navy sailors mutinied rather than sail out for a final suicide mission against the more powerful Royal Navy. Public anger turned against the Kaiser and the military who led them into the war, and a full-fledged revolution in early November forced Wilhelm to abdicate and flee to the Netherlands. Meanwhile, the Allies renewed their propaganda efforts on the home front, better managed relations with labor unions, and took advantage of the morale boost from American troop ships arriving in France to make sure that even fragile states like Italy held on. Of course, millions of Germans, military and civilian, wanted to keep fighting. But millions did not, and that tipped the balance. As the crisis deepened, Germany's top generals at first insisted victory was just around the corner. In the late summer, they panicked and admitted defeat, a cycle they repeated more than once in the second half of the year. In mid-August, Ludendorff and Hindenburg informed the Kaiser and Chancellor Georg von Hertling that Germany could not win the war. Ludendorff then changed his mind on this question, but after the collapse of Bulgaria in late September, he announced on October 3rd that Berlin had to seek an armistice since the war was irretrievably lost. He also told Hindenburg that he had no confidence in the troops, since in his view, they'd been infected by socialism. The German high command had led the army into disastrous offensives and now undermined what was left of morale by admitting defeat so suddenly. Historian David Stevenson summed up the impact. The German army, for all its virtuosity, was let down by a failure of generalship. So, 1918 saw the German army defeated in the field and a general German collapse in morale, but it also saw the failure of German wartime politics. From 1916, the German military is- Sorry, sorry, guys. The German army for all its virtuosity was let down. This makes it seem as though the war was lost because of, you know, failure of generalship, where it seems like the war was lost on the battlefield and the nonstop, the nonstop uh, coming of, of troops from you know Britain, America, and then in the end, yeah, it looks like they're like, oh, oh, uh, like yeah, that that's weird. But I feel like this statement seems like the failure of the generalship is is the reason why the the war itself was lost. Maybe I'm, I'm making this maybe it's not supposed to be applied that way ship 
So, 1918 saw the German army defeated in the field and a general German collapse in morale, but it also saw the failure of German wartime politics. From 1916, the German military established an informal dictatorship, and they turned out to be pretty bad at governing. Different interest groups among the German civilian and military elites struggled to give the war a coherent meaning, and none of them really succeeded. The Army High Command generally saw no political solution to the war, and so insisted on and mistakenly believed in their own military superiority until it was too late to avoid defeat. The Kaiser and High Command stuck to maximum war aims at the cost of a potentially more effective strategy. They still insisted on annexing Belgium, Luxembourg and parts of France until summer 1918. Ludendorff and Hindenburg even forced Foreign Minister Richard von Kuhlmann to resign when he said that the war could not be decided by military means alone. These rigid objectives were at okay. oh, First of all, it's crazy how much color makes them seem so much more relatable, you know, than uh, black and white, but... Uh... Hindenburg even and parts of France until summer 1918. Ludendorff and Hindenburg even forced Foreign Minister Richard von Kuhlmann to resign when he said that the war could not be decided by military means alone. I'm not saying that that can't be a logical move, but it sounds like... Okay. Uh, this is what makes the Japanese in World War II, like, my, my, like, if I had to fight against any army in modern history, say, by modern history, I'd say, like, Napoleonic Wars up until today, right? I feel like fighting the Japanese in World War II would be horrific because of their seemingly religious attitude. F fanatical attitude towards I I've said this before I I've seen uh, film documentary uh, black and white footage of of mothers in Japan Japanese mothers jumping off of cliffs with their baby nonchalantly and rather than be captured I don't mean like it looked like she was like oh what do I do it just looks like she was going for a stroll and just like oh there's a cliff jump if I'm a soldier, that terrifies me more than anything that a male combat soldier can do. Because if their women with babies are that fanatical, how are they? How are you ever going to reason or get these people to surrender? And so, just having that attitude that no matter, I mean, it took two bomb, two atomic bombs, pretty much saying like, we have a delete button and we, you, you, you don't have the, the option anymore to, um, I, I'm not saying I know whether, I know it's still debated, was it necessary to drop the atomic bombs? Uh, but the fact that it, it took that, like, you don't have the option to, all right, fine, invade us, you might win but we're going to make it so costly for you in death that you can imagine. And based on the stuff I'm learning about the Japanese soldiers and the populace in World War II, I don't think they, I think it probably did take, like, okay, they don't even have to land here to annihilate us. They have these giant bombs they can drop. And just, yeah, terrifying. I forget my original point I was going to make. Oh, yeah, them saying, like, Sir, I don't think we're going to win. Uh, uh, you're fired. These rigid objectives were at odds with Germany's allies like Austria. I went on a tangent there. I'm sorry. All right. It means alone. These rigid objectives were at odds with Germany's allies like Austria-Hungary, who wanted peace as soon as possible starting in 1916. The Allies coordinated far better, aligning their positions on Alsace-Lorraine, the breakup of Austria-Hungary, and the League of Nations, even though, of course, some of this consensus would break down after the war. And although Germany won in the East in 1918, the High Command kept hundreds of thousands of German troops tied up occupying the territories they'd forced Russia to give them, leaving fewer resources for the campaign in the West. 
In the turmoil of the former Russian imperial territories, the German authorities weren't even able to extract the food that they needed from the lands that they'd conquered, even after the so-called bread peace with the new Ukrainian state. These policies were at odds with the desire of most regular Germans for peace, like this soldier in fall 1918. Why didn't we dispatch a peace note when our offensives had their greatest success? No, now when we're taking it on the chin, they want to make peace again. Just gambler attitude. Why didn't I leave when I was up 50 grand? All right, why am I just giving up when I'm down 20,000? Why didn't I just leave? Because you, when you're on a winning streak, this is what I think about, I'm not, I'm not so confident and know enough about the Napoleonic Wars to really say this, but I think about Germany, and I hear people in response to this say, well, they needed oil. Or, you know, they, well, they needed oil for continued expansion in order to invade Russia and, 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 and everything else. But why start Operation Barbarossa? Why not solidify your European holdings and then say, I dare you? To invade us now, uh, not because Russia you still have a uh, a treaty with, right? Like, imagine if Germany in World War II stopped after they conquered mainland Europe and before Operation Barbarossa, and just say, just started to solidify, just say, okay, stop here. But it's like when you're on a win streak. Look how fast we took France, like. Like, go, go. Oh, now look at how weak Russia is. Go, go. And I think it, it, the gambler attitude is, is my best guess. Just like it, now, when we're taking it on the chin, they want to make peace again. Just like in December of 1916. On the home front, the military leadership consistently turned to coercion as a tool of governance against strikers and other unhappy citizens. When Chancellor von Hertling told Ludendorff about the brewing unrest in September, the Quartermaster General simply replied that more repression was required. Austria-Hungary did the same, constantly seeking to root out disloyal Slavs, executing thousands of its own Ukrainian citizens on suspicion of having Russian sympathies, and moving seven divisions to the interior to keep order against roaming deserters. Germany also failed to react to crises and support its allies in 1918. Austria-Hungary was suffering from extreme hunger in the Austrian half of the empire, but what little food the Central Powers did get from Ukraine Iran. went mostly to Germany. Ludendorff famously had a breakdown when the Bulgarian front collapsed, since by gambling everything on the west and leaving large occupation forces in the east, Germany had nothing left to support the Austrians in Italy or the Bulgarians in the Balkans. The Allies, on the other hand, had leaders who were flawed, but more legitimate and more representative of the men in the front lines and the people in the factories at home. President Wilson's message that the war was a crusade of democracy was more effective as a result. They also used their command of the sea and good relations with neutrals like the US until 1917 and Argentina to help feed and fund the war effort and, for example, support Italy and France in their worst moments of economic and military crisis. The German Empire waged a war of risks from 1914 to 1918, a war that ended in bitter defeat. Berlin took these risks because it was the weaker side, but none of them could stave off total defeat. The final gamble in spring 1918 also ultimately failed. The high command had no strategic goals, the army was beaten in the field by a superior enemy, the generals admitted defeat, and the other central powers collapsed. The home Question, guys. Was this not a main reason Germany wanted to fight the war? I know the war started because of Arch, you know, Franz Ferdinand, Evrillo, Prince, you know, being assassinated. But the reason why Germany wanted to fight, what was it not to to gain that sort of influence and power and wealth that countries like France and England had? It, wasn't that the whole? a giant point or the whole point of them really wanting to win the war not just to come to the defense of the austro-hungarians but uh, against the serbs and and the russians but to it just seems like they in the late 1800s and the early 1900s up to world war one just they wanted to be 
at the table and as powerful as colonial powers like Britain and France, eventually America. So wasn't this that, that a big gamble of theirs? Anyone? And another thing, obviously, the when you're someone who's up, up in the top and you're a general or you're in like the highest society or you're in power and you're losing a war and you hear, you know, like, oh, l let's have peace terms. Well, that's, that's easy for you to say, you know, you're not, you're a peasant or like you're a lower class. You're, you're like, you're going to stop dying, right? To us, we're not dying already and we're just going to lose our status and maybe get tried as war criminals and all this. And so I think at that point of war, I don't think this is just Germany, but anyone where you're at the higher, you're the ones making the decisions, not the ones dying and fighting. You, you, you care more about the self-preservation of your lifestyle and your status, and you're willing to, to keep having them die to keep that. Because it's like, if we have an armistice, there's no way I'm staying in power. Or, you know, so I, I think that that's a harsh reality, too. Front collapse did it. Please let me know, guys, anything I'm saying, if it's wrong, if you disagree, I really want to see it. Indeed, and the other central powers collapsed. The home front collapse did indeed help end the war, but given the army was beaten, in retreat, and disintegrating due to poor morale, there was no stab in the back, as Ludendorff and the Nazis later claimed. That myth, however, would help convince many Germans they'd never lost, with deadly consequences consequences for the next world war. In 1945, however, the Allies didn't stop before the German borders to avoid the mistakes of 1918. In early 1945, the Allies set their eyes on the Rhine in Western Germany, and the Red Army was gearing up for their Berlin operation. I gotta say it again, self-preservation, even when it comes to it. Oh, we, oh God, it, we are gonna lose. Uh... It's their fault, right? It's, it's the Jews or like it, it's someone else. Oh, God, get them. Don't get us. The Battle of the Rhineland would be the last set piece battle in the West and the Battle of Berlin, the last one in the East. Millions of Allied soldiers stood at the ready to bring the Third Reich to its knees and the last German reserves would have to defend it. If you're curious about these two often overlooked battles of World War II, we produced two documentary series that together run for more than eight hours. In Rhineland 45, we cover the battle for the Lower Rhine from the Reichswald at the Dutch-German border until the Allied crossing of the Rhine that involved the biggest single-day paratrooper landing of the entire war. In 16 days in Berlin, we document the entire two-week Battle of Berlin day by day. Both documentary series were filmed on original location, feature expert guests like Ian from Forgotten Weapons or David Willey from the Tank Museum, and they show the Second World War in an uncompromising way that wouldn't be possible to show on YouTube. So where can you watch 16 Days in Berlin and Rhineland 45? On Nebula, a streaming service we built together with other creators. On Nebula, we don't have to worry about the algorithm or advertiser guidelines, and the viewers there support us directly simply by watching our videos, which, by the way, are ad-free and usually uploaded earlier than on YouTube. If you head over to nebula.tv slash thegreatwar and sign up, you can save 40% on an annual subscription right now and watch 16 Days in Berlin, Rhineland 45, or our brand new Nebula original series Red Atoms about the Soviet nuclear program. And that's not all. Apart from a growing number of Nebula Originals, your subscription now also includes classes. In our newest class, I teach you everything about producing a real-time history documentary and give you a glimpse behind the curtains of our production methods. That's nebula.tv slash The Great War for 40% off on annual subscriptions and supporting us at real-time history directly. As usual, you can find all the sources for this video in the description down below. If you want to watch some other First World War analysis videos, check out the recent videos we posted about the downfall of the Imperial Russian Army, or another one about the Battle of Cambrai, where Germany learned the wrong lessons about tank warfare. If you're watching this video on Patreon or Nebula, thank you so much for the support. I'm Jesse Alexander, and this is a production of Real Time History, the only history channel that is also sick of the Schwindlers on YouTube. Does Swindler come from that? Uh, guys, if you're interested in that, please make sure to use all uh, their links on their videos. The link to their video right here of all the ones I watch, always at the very top of the description. Click on it, send you right to there. Um, so, major things I would love to get answered. 
there was one major thing I wanted to, to ask at the end of the video, but I, I wanted to wait, and, and now I can't remember it. So, um, I think it was just to reiterate some other things I, I said earlier, ask questions. But anyways, awesome video. Hope you guys enjoyed it, learned something, or can teach me something in the comments. And uh, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.